Good morning. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm glad that after so many years of uh, fighting the machines and the programmers, we can meet here in peace. Uh, and uh, for, my, for my entire chess career, developers were trying to beat me coming up with smarter and smarter machines. And uh, now when, and eventually they did. And now when machines are about to start programming themselves, I think it's time for me to share how I felt 20 years ago. And uh, back then, so when uh, um, I just had to face this, uh, this imminent defeat, uh, I um, heard programmers telling me, they kept telling me, Gary, so don't take it personally. It's, um, it's for great benefits of humanity. It's a great victory for all of us. Uh, I think now the roles are reversed. I'm here to tell you not to be afraid. Yeah, so AI will not replace you. So, and uh, if I could, you know, survive it, so can you. But before we actually talk about the real or imaginative threats of AI, I think we have to agree on a definition because, you know, following this public debate or, you know, just it's, it's the, all these this, the noises around the eye. So I, I feel that we're at such an early stage of understanding the, this phenomena and this new disruptive technology that without this philosophical uh, um, uh, um, explanations, it will be very difficult for us to sort of to anticipate, to anticipate what is real and what is not. And uh, most of these debates are just, to my taste, they are almost religious debates. Because people talk about, you know, it's uh, AI will be a savior, you know, it will open the, uh, the doors to paradise, to heaven. Or, you know, a much bigger group is saying, no, 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 it's just, you know, it's, uh, it's the end of the world, the end of humanity. Uh, it will destroy everything, you know, it's Pandora box, it's opening the gates of hell. AI is not a magic wand that is not a terminator. It's not a harbinger of utopia or dystopia. It's a technology invented by us humans. And it's very important to understand what it is. Uh, I think that the public believes today that we are you know, with AI at the stage of Windows 10, while I believe we are at early MS-DOS era. And, and since you know, we are at early stage, you know, again, understanding this phenomenon is important. And I think that we, we yet to agree even on, on the definition of this acronym. So, and I show later that I have my doubts about letter A, the artificial, but as for I, intelligence, I don't think we have any, any reasons to argue. And of course, chess has been seen for a long time as the nexus of human intelligence and creativity. Um, and uh, here's the slide shows uh, founding fathers. The Alfred Binet um, was the co-creator of um, IQ test and, uh, by, by the end of the 19th century. And he was fascinated by the minds of chess players especially those who could play chess blind without looking at the, at, at the chess board. He believed that if he could reveal the secrets of, of their minds, chess players' minds, that could you know, unlock the, uh, the secrets of human intelligence. Yeah, it's flattering, but I can tell you the aptitude for playing chess is nothing else than the aptitude for playing chess. Uh, though, again, it's, it's, you know, it could help to understand how people are making decisions, but it was, it was not even near of these revelations that had been expected. But somehow, uh, these beliefs, they transcended to new generation of scientists, and the founding fathers of computer science, Alan Turing, Claude Shannon, Norbert Wiener, they all believed that when, not if, when machines would prevail in the game of chess, this day will be the dawn of the era, they didn't know the term artificial intelligence, of intelligent machines, you know, making the entry to our, to our world. Actually, they were wrong. And it's very important to understand why such geniuses could make this, this, uh, the wrong, sort of the wrong assumption about the future of human-machine relations. 
And I think one of the, psych uh, the psychological mistakes, actually there were two of them, but we'll start with, with the first one, is they had no access to massive computing power. So they have been operating with such a meager computing power, so they knew that chess was technically, mathematically infinite, according to Claude Shannon. The number of legal moves in the game of chess was that astronomical number of 10 to the 46 power, 46 zeros. That's quite a lot for any computer to get busy until the end of time. Uh, so that's why they made an automatic assumption that simple calculations will not make it. So machines will have to think like humans, to play like humans. So, and that's the mistake we make today, because somehow we think that, you know, unless machines sort of follow our way of thinking, our path of making decisions, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it, if, if they don't do it, it's, it's, it's no good. But machines, machines do it in their own way. The airplanes are flying faster than any bird without flapping their wings. Deep blue uh, or other chess computers, they, they, they could beat strong, s s strongest chess players. You know, they, they could outperform us without outthinking us. So that brings us to another psychological mistake that it's not about machines being perfect. It's not about machines solving the problem. It's about machines making fewer mistakes. That's very important to, to, to remember. It's, it's about sort of better bottom line. It's about simply now just uh, avoiding mistakes that, 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 that hu human, humans make. So uh, since, you know, this, this, this the belief was, was there that, that chess would be the ultimate test for, for the future uh, intelligent machines. So there were many, many attempts to actually to move forward with, um, uh, with different t type of chess computers. And uh, my first experience of uh, playing um, chess computers was in 1985 in June in Hamburg, just a few months before I won the world championship. And um, for some of you, you know, it's a it's, it's, it's familiar scene of Grandmaster going around facing a bunch of players, but this time they were not players real players, they were computers. The 32 small chess playing uh, devices, again, maybe some of you still have it, so the pieces of antique. Uh, I see people of roughly my age in the audience, very few. So, uh, and, uh, um, and I faced 32 of them, four leading manufacturers of these devices, eight models each, and um, surprise, surprise, I won all the games. Now, this, hello what? Seems machines are just, you know, they're haunting me all the time. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, uh, but surprise would be if I lost or even drew one game, because people thought machines were, you know, too weak. And uh, and when I look at this at this picture, so it reminds me of the golden age of human machine relations, because you know, look, machines were bulky and weak, and uh, my stomach was flat and hair was strong. Um, now, that was 1985. In 1997, I faced only one computer. That was IBM's Deep Blue. Now, for the sake of historical truths, I always remind people it was the rematch because I won the first one in Philadelphia in 1996. Just not to forget about it. Uh, but if we are looking for, um, uh, for a watershed moment, in, in these matches, I have to say that I would rather pick the first game in Philadelphia. As I said, I, I won the match. But I lost game one and then won three games, fought back, won three games, and won the match. But the very fact that machine could be the strongest chess player of a time in a normal game, when I say normal, it's six hours game under tournament conditions, that was really like a, a writing on a wall. It's just, it's, the, the rest would be a matter of time. Also, I have to say that we already experienced by 1996-97, we are leading players, some painful defeats from smaller chess uh, computers, chess engines, uh, early chess engines, in so-called blitz, five minutes chess, or rapid chess, 25 minutes chess. And we, again, made another assumption, totally wrong, that if we play long game, if we could play six hours, seven hours, then we could, you know, not just survive, but we could be superior, wrong because machines also, you know, could spend more time. And eventually, it's all about making fewer mistakes. And machines, you know, prove to be steady hand. Now, was it the beginning of AI? Absolutely not, because Deep Blue was as intelligent as your alarm clock. A $10 million piece, expensive one, 
But still, it was not about intelligence. It was about, you know, brute force. Uh, 200 million positions per second. Now, that's, that was a pretty good record in 1997. Though, if you have a free chess app on your mobile device today, it's stronger than Deep Blue. So, and I'm not even talking about uh, chess engines that you can download to your computer. Because today, the gap between the strongest chess engines and Magnus Carlsen, current world champion, is about the same as between Usain Bolt and Ferrari. So the competition is over. And that's a classical cycle that we are facing all the time. So first, machines, they look to weak, you know, just uh, totally helpless. Then they, they, they can compete, but we're still superior. Then there is a window, a short window of competition where we can play and nobody knows, you know, just it's who will be on top. But eventually, eventually, machines, machines uh, prevail. By roughly year 2005, the competition was over because after 1997, I still played, uh, uh, played um, a couple of more matches that are less publicized because there was no IBM PR machine behind it. I drew both matches with a German program, Israeli program. But it was clear, one, you know, it's, it's a one-way street. And uh, since, you know, we're talking about human versus machine, so I thought it would be probably relevant just to remind about the old story. So it's the, uh, the 19th century African-American uh, folk tale and also a song uh, about a man called John Henry. So um, he was the railroad worker, uh, huge, Strong man, strongest among his peers, uh, still driving man. And uh, um, in the late 19th century, all across America, uh, uh, mostly actually, this is people worked you know, at the railroad uh, constructions, mostly uh, immigrants and former slaves. And they were, go they were driving through the mountain of rock by using the steel spikes, huge hammers, and their muscles. Um, and the legend goes that one day a salesman came by with uh, a new invention, a steam power drill. Um, and he said it would be faster uh, than any man. And of course, John Henry picked up this challenge. It was a bet. So the race was on John Henry versus uh, steam power drill, human versus machine. And you know, for cheering crowds, uh, John Henry won. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's then and now, people always cheer up. They're always happy when machines lose. But I'm afraid that at the end, you know, machines always win. So the, sadly, the story ends up as a tragedy because after this tremendous victory, John Henry dies from the strain on his heart. And, uh, you know, he's, he dies famously with his hammer on his ha in his hand. Um, and uh, um, I think this story, you know, just it's, it's, it's a first you know, reminder of, of this, you know, of us humans seeing machines as evil, as a dangerous threat, as a job destroyer, something that could, you know, uh, tear our lives apart. And for the railroad workers, you know, that was a real threat because it could steal their jobs away. But now just imagine what kind of jobs they were doing. So we're just going through this mountain of rock, you know, using these primitive instruments. So thousands and thousands of men died, you know, uh, at, at, from exhaustion and, and traumas. Uh, uh, and very few of them could bear this work for more than a couple of years. So the reason that machine could do this job, you know, faster and safer, I guess, you know, should give us reasons to celebrate. Yeah, people say, ah, that's physical labor. It's nothing to do with what is happening nowadays. But as we could see in a few moments, the work, even you know, in, in intellectual work, uh, cognitive tasks, they could also be crushing and, and, very, and, 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 and repetitive. So again, it's the, this story echoes you know, what, what's happening now. And when people are just really concerned about the job losses and about the threats from in intelligent machines to our livelihood, I'm telling them that it's not new. It's just, you know, it's a historical cycle. So, and uh, eventually, you know, we, we, we bring machines to help us to uh, do, our, do our work and to become more creative because machines can do the repetitive tasks, the, the, the rod jobs, and we can be more human by, by unleashing our 
cre creativity. Yeah, and uh, by the way, did I say that the blue was not intelligent enough? Yeah, but actually it was intelligent enough that first to avoid the playing rematch against me, this, the next one. I, in my book, I said that IBM made a good decision for business, but I was not happy because it was some sort of betrayal of science. But actually, Deep Blue found a new job because I was looking for it, and now I found out it's making sushi in JFK Airport. <laughs> in Terminal 5. Yeah. So it's, it's almost a torture because I fly so often, you know, and I go through this terminal. I could see Deep Blue, you know. I love sushi, never ate there. Uh, so. Um, but now, OK, going back to 1997, I lost the match, and I had to figure out what's next for me, for my game. And I was licking my wounds. I was ruminating. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I thought, wait a second. You cannot beat them. Join them. So how about bringing together humans and machines, human creativity, human imagination, and machines' brute force and machines' memories? So next year, 1998, I came up with a concept that I called advanced chess. Human plus machine facing another human plus machine. I thought it could be a perfect test for, you know, for um, these combined, combined uh, qualities. Uh, and um, what we found out over years and years practicing this, some people call freestyle chess because you can play in any combination. So basically open for cheating, using machines, other guys. And so it's, it's, it's an open-ended competition. But what's very important is that the most effective combination does not require the best human, the, the most, of, most of talent. It doesn't require a strongest and fastest machine, though it does not hurt. What is most important is a superior process. We found time and again that a weaker player with slower machine, older machine, could actually beat a stronger player with a faster machine if he or she had a superior process. It's about interface. So this is something about the future of human-machine relations. So we always have to you know, find our right spot. And machines could do more and more. So the, our territory in these relations could be shrinking. But still, it was very important to understand what this machine needs for the specific task and for us to compensate for machines' deficiencies. And it sounds a little bit boring and some say even insulting, but it's, again, that's the future. And, and it's, it still could be a very, you know, a very creative opportunity for humans actually to decide how to shift uh, what direction this in enormous in machine's power that keeps increasing, keeps increasing uh, um, every day. So to understand better, sometimes you need just to, uh, this, this, our role, and to understand this, this scientific process, so you have to look, you know, outside of science. And uh, it's one of my favorite quotes that comes from, from the world of art. Uh, it sounds like a paradox, but I can tell you, it's just it's, it's a piece of wisdom. Because at the end of the day, and Picasso, as the, as the great artist, he knew it, questions are a beginning. You just have to ask a question before you look for an answer. And uh, can machines ask questions? Yes, they can. They just don't know what questions are relevant. So that's why I would not. I would not hurry just, you know, burying, you know, us, you know, and just an announcing just humanity redundant because we still have the power, we still have the, um, uh, the privilege of uh, asking uh, relevant, relevant questions. And as I said, it's, um, it's, um, it's an illusion that we are now, we are dealing, you know, uh, today with the challenges that we never met before because intelligent works, the cognitive task, they're so different. So many jobs in the 19th century and early 20th century were lost in agriculture. People moved from the countryside to the cities. Then there were era of manufacturing, and these many jobs have been lost as well. So now, what's the difference? Ah, today the jobs at stake are coming you know, from people with college degrees and Twitter accounts. But at the end of the day, it's the same historical cycle. And uh, we think that you know, if you are just uh, do something you know, with writing or just pushing computer buttons, that's you know, intellectual and creative. Check the statistics. That's a McKinsey report about US job market. It's not about jobs, it's work activities. Work activities requiring median human creativity, 4%. And even emotional sensing, 29%. But 4% creativity, what does it tell you? That you have 96% of jobs that are like zombie jobs. They're dead. They just don't know it yet. 
So, um, so it's a, I'm not telling it's good or bad. It's happening. So just, you know, we should not, you know, waste our time talking about spilled milk, you know, what under the bridge. It's happening, and we should recognize that the challenge is not that machines, they're becoming more human. The problem is that for, for several generations, for a few decades, we have been increasingly doing work that is machine-like. So now, just, just we have to recognize it and just start, you know, just uh, reorganizing ourselves. And um, again, it's, uh, it's, it's not, you know, it's not, again, something new. Because the jobs do not disappear, they always evolve. I say that everything destroys something, but nothing destroys everything. So it's, you know, it's a challenge for this generation. I'm 56, I guess the average age of this audience, much younger. So, so it's for you to figure it out. But I'm happy to share my experience. So um, now we come to the important point I mentioned in the beginning. Why I'm not happy with artificial intelligence? Because I think it doesn't reflect properly the relations between human and machines. I strongly suggest we say it augmented. Because it's about augmenting our senses as telescope. It hasn't replaced our vision. It augmented it. By the way, it's still very important how you use it. If you put it you know, just down to earth you will, or just the ground, you'll not see anything. You have to find the right direction. And often in history, the telescope prove theoretical calculations made in the studies. And um, we have a cycle, a cycle that that's, that's it's, you can call a typical one, that you start with brute force machines that follow human instructions. By the way, most of the computers today still you know, operate with this framework. Then you have smarter machines that partner with experts using superior processes. That's, you know, form of advanced chess, and now you could see it everywhere, in medicine, in finance, so humans operating with machines. So the, the RPA business, the, um, it's, 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 it's uh, growing really, really fa uh, fast, so this is automation. Um, and uh, uh, then the future is the operators guide groups of AI algorithms. It's just the beginning. I don't want you to, to, to spend our precious time talking about sort of new programs like uh, um, Alpha, Alpha Zero, the developed by Google's DeepMind. Uh, it's about machines that can operate within human design frameworks. Basically, you know, moving from processing human generated data to generating its own data, its own knowledge. It still, you know, leaves humans with a very important task to create the framework. Because at the end of the day, Machines today, that's the, they can succeed only in specialized areas, in what I call closed systems. The game of chess, the game of Go, Dota, Starcraft, Texas Hold'em Poker, you name it. But they're all closed systems. So in open-ended systems, machines are quite helpless because they can never recognize the moment when they reach territory of diminishing returns. So it's a future, it's moving in this direction, and I can, I, I, I would welcome this future. I think it's, it's, it's good that we, we have this opportunity. So just to move from the stage that, that we are today now, it's a, I would call it a optimization, to, a tra to a, real tra a, re a real transformation. Again, AI term has been used for anything now. It's just you know, like a word strategy. It has been used and abused. So we should recognize that you know, it's the true AI is it's just, it's just it's about to make its entry. And, and it's, it's, not, you know, it's not something that, that, that we should be afraid of. By the way, speaking about future of humans and machines, so just go back and look at the early sci-fi genre, the, the, this, the famous books. So you go to the 50s and the 60s, and the, whole, the stories were full of you know, robots that are just um, uh, making their way in our world, helping us, and they were moving. So it's quite an ironic, it's a paradox. So uh, that the early you know, uh, um, forecasts about the future were about robots that were moving but not being so smart. As a matter of fact, today we have exactly the, the reverse situation. The machines can think and outthink us, uh, but, uh, um, but without actually making any moves. So while machines are just you know, solving very complex problems, but when you look at the when you look at, the, at their ability to move physically, so they cannot even compete with a two-year-old child. So uh, it's, again, it's a moronic paradox that the machines are good at what humans are not and, and uh, other way around. Again, it just tells us that our attempts to predict the future based on our anticipations 
of science development, yeah, and that's, they were not always successful. Again, that means that we should not, should not worry and simply move forward. And um, now, when I hear that technology benefits young, as I said, I'm 56. Um, my kids are much better than myself, you know, just in doing uh, this stuff. And, uh, and you can see how it just it changes from generation to generation, the 90s, 2000, you know, the first decade, and now the kids swiping their finger on, on the computer screen. So I could even see the difference between two of my kids. My daughter is 12 and a half. My son is turning four. And a uh, couple of months ago, he discovered his elder sister's uh, uh, old DVDs, cartoons. He was surprised. He was trying to find out what it is, maybe Frisbees, because he'd never seen them. So in, in his mind, it's just, you don't need anything just you know, to, to, to use your computer. So it's the, so it changes, but it's actually not necessarily bad news because it helps all the people you know, that that's don't know how to code properly, so uh, like myself, just an opportunity to actually use our expertise because what these new machines will need it's with, you know, with voice recognition and with other, uh, other features and functions that could help us to, 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 uh, to um, communicate with them with very easy interfaces. So it's, it will require wisdom and knowledge. So we have plenty, plenty of that. And by the way, when I hear that people you know, keep complaining about, that, about this new technology that is, oh, this is, it's, it will not offer people in 50s and 60s a chance to succeed, I always tell them technology is the main reason why so many of us are still alive to complain about technology. It's, it's amazing that this human, human it's probably it's, it's, it's inevitable. It's in our mind, yeah. we always look at the benefits. But we just don't recognize that nothing comes, you know, uh, just it's, uh, separately. It's, it's a package. And by the way, technology is agnostic. It's neither good or bad. It's not evil or inherently good. It's about, about us using this. It's, 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 it's a human's choice. And let's not forget that humans still have monopoly for evil. And that's why I'm always, you know, confused when I hear about, you know, debates about AI, AI's ethics. Do you seriously believe you can have AI more ethical than its, its, its creator? So AI simply reflects our bias. And if AI shows bias uh, in gender disparity or racial disparities, because we still have it in our society. So how about you know, just uh, fixing problems here, not complaining about the mirror? That's an easy way to just to distort the mirror. But we probably should look inside. So um, there's something else I wanted also to mention, because again, speaking about old people that are complaining, though, by the way, uh, I'm sure you know this is your parents and grandparents, they know how to use cell phones. I bet they never use computers, but they know how to use cell phones. My mother is 82, and she learned how to track my flights on the internet. So sometimes she tells me about the detours the plane made, and she was so worried. Uh, but there's something else people are just missing completely. It's the, there's an army of people that never had a chance to work, to show their talent. I'm talking about disabled people. So when, we, when we're talking about the jobs being lost, so what about people that do not see blind people? Now, AI is not just good for driverless cars, but it's also good for, for helping people to hear what the machine see, sees. Uh, so for d deaf people, so it could help to actually to, to visualize w the sounds. So imagine how much talent could, could, jo could join this, this, this uh, uh, job market. Uh, so it says people can walk, the, uh, the robots can be operated by, by even brain impulses. So it's, it's an evolution. I'm not, I don't want to sound callous. I know that is, is the people, you know, just that, that will be on the losing end. But, I mean, speaking, for instance, about radiology, I hear it all the time. Oh, this is the machines are doing better and better job there in, in recognizing the, all forms of, of cancer and other diseases. Uh, and uh, so what will happen with these well-paid jobs? Yes, I agree. Some of them, you know, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of these good jobs, they will go away. But what's happened at the other end? The cost goes down. 
the cost goes down, more people can afford it. So for 1,000 jobs lost in America or in Germany, how many lives, maybe millions of lives, can be saved in Africa or Asia? So it's, again, it's, it's a balance. But it's, if we consider ourselves, you know, human race, uh, humanity as, as one unit, so we always benefit. And, um, you know, you hear from someone, you know, who suffered the first uh, defeat uh, um, as, an, as a knowledge worker. So I, I know it was very painful. Going back to 1997, yes, yes, I, it was an outburst. I was very unhappy. Not because I lost a machine, because I, it was the first match I lost, period. But again, it's about how we use these lessons, how we move forward. And um, I just want to quickly summarize this thing. So it just goes through the cycles. The intelligent tech advances from weak toys to useful tools, and eventually to disruptive substitutes. And then human plus machine. That's my favorite topic. I believe that's the future. It means finding better ways to combine better process and also you know, uh, processing the data. And machines will solve bigger and bigger problems. So humans still ask the questions and define success. Again, there's always a room for us to actually to, um, uh, be sort of at the driving seat. It just, you know, Imagine that you have a very, very powerful gun, and uh, all you can do is to, to tune the, uh, uh, change the, slightly change the direction of the bullet in the barrel. Now, one millimeter in the barrel most likely will be 10 meters gap one mile away. So it seems that we do little, but the outcome can be really great if we know how to make this tune. So that's why do not be afraid, do not be ashamed, do not be confused by the sort of shrinking role of humans in, in, this, in this combination. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, it's, um, it's, it's where, we, where we're heading for. So we, we will belong to the last few decimal places, but that's how we can make all the difference. And of course, that's important. So that's the smarter tools are more powerful, and easier to use. That's why there's always a chance for all the people to, to get adjusted. So, and require less training and retraining. And by the way, I think the problem is not AI's taking over too fast. I think it's too slow. Because as I mentioned already, many jobs are already doomed. And, and at, if we protract agony, nothing you know, helps these jobs to survive. But we are postponing the moment where we create new jobs to create new industries and also to generate more income to help those who are left behind. And as I said, AI is augmented. I strongly suggest we gradually shift to, to this term. And we are not being replaced. We are being promoted. That's, that's what I believe in. And um, since you know, uh, we all know, we all, um, know that one, uh, one of the greatest sources of this dystopian vision of the future is Hollywood because all Hollywood movies created these images, dark images of the, of, of the future. So I always want to actually fight back with the same images, saying that you could look at them from a different angle. So do you find it encouraging? No, just it seems that people are terrified. Actually, uh, I think it's, it's, by the way, it's, if you look at it from you know, my angle of observation, so you will figure it out. That's, it's, it's, it's good news. I mean, first, first movie, 1984, the Terminator is human versus machine, humans won. But the second and the third, if you look at these at this, uh, two movies, it's about humans plus old machines, though, of course, we know Arnold is all but not obsolete. So versus new machines and humans human-machine combination, one in both cases. Again, it's a stretch, I know it's a stretch, but still, it's an opportunity for us to actually recognize that human-plus-machine combination could offer us limitless opportunities. And by the way, the picture, you know, just in, in the corner, it's not a Photoshop, it's a real one. So I was in, in Arnold's office in uh, March 2003, we played a game of chess, he was a big fan, um, he knew how to move the pieces, and uh, he... He, um, he, had, uh, uh, he had chess as a mandatory lesson for his kids, so we played the game. I was smart enough not to win. <laughs> it was a draw, and, and I guess I, it, it was so encouraging for him that six months later, he ran for the governorship of California and won. 
But now, it's, it's a kind of a joke. But the next image, which is my absolute favorite one, that tells more about human-machine relations than anything else. Empire Strikes Back, the original one. I'm sure that many st uh, Star Wars fans there. Now, of course, you remember the moment. Han Solo is desperately trying to escape from Imperial Guard. And the only way is just to move his spaceship into the asteroid field. And you remember the C-3PO telling him in a squeaky voice, the chances of surviving in the asteroid field? Anybody remember his number? 3,720 to 1. Did the machine know the odds? Absolutely. The answers never tell me the odds. Now, why it's important? Just jokes aside. Because they were both right. Machines knew the odds. The chances of surviving in the asteroid field were slim to none. But the human knew that there was no other option. What was the choice? Going back and being caught? From machine's perspective, being caught by Imperial Guard, tortured by Darth Vader to die in 10 hours is preferable than to die in 10 seconds being hit by an asteroid. Humans knew it was not an option. Machine was not in the position to evaluate the, this one, because this one had so much you know, value against this 3,720. So that tells us that while machine knows the odds, it's still for us to make the final, to make a final decision. And when people say, oh, it's, the, it's, it's a fantasy, it's a sci-fi, I can easily come up with tons of stories and just situations almost identical. I mean, just imagine, you know, you have your wallet connected to your computer and, and machine runs your finances. It knows everything, your uh, salary, your bonuses, your mortgages, everything. And you are in, the, in, in, in a store, you're buying a gift, an expensive gift, and machine with Siri voice telling you, no, 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 too expensive, running out of money. Machine knows the odds. Now, let me make a slight, you know, alteration. You have your son or your daughter next to you, and it's a birthday gift. From machine's perspective, nothing changes. From your perspective, everything changes. By the way, it doesn't have to be a happy family. It could be a happy family, it could be a broken family, it could be weekend visitation. It's important that you make this decision because sometimes knowing the odds doesn't give you sort of the, the, right, uh, sort of the right idea uh, how to make the final decision. And uh, just to summarize what I said is, I learned the hard way that fighting the machines quickly becomes a, a dead end. But I realized it in time to adjust and to learn instead how to work with them, how to use their, um, uh, them as the uh, increasingly powerful tools. Um, machines, they're getting just more and more, more powerful, and, uh, and it's, it's still for us to actually to, to decide how we, how we co 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 collaborate with them. Um, old machines, they made us stronger by doing physical labor. They made us faster, capable of circling the, the globe and uh, rocketing to the moon. Our new intelligent machines will make us smarter, capable of anything. So we need to be more ambitious. We need more ambitious projects. We need more exploration. We need more adventure. Um, our machines are great of doing things we know how to do well. So that's why we need to uh, look for new challenges. We need to push into the unknown. So we need to explore. And uh, we should remember that future is, uh, is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And we're still in control. We still can determine our fate. And if we believe in the bright future of the augmented intelligence, so we'll be more ambitious. We'll be more eager to explore and to empower ourselves with the new revolution technologies as we always did in the past. Machines don't make us obsolete. They make our lives better. And let me say again, so we're not being replaced. We're being promoted. Thank you.